Okay, so I want to go over chapter one with you today so you have a good understanding of what the material is about. So this chapter is an introduction to cognitive psychology. So we're going to talk a lot about the history that make that made cognition a big part of the field of psychology. So to start out, when we think about the word cognition, we've got to think about a definition that explains to us what the word means. Cognition can involve anything related to our mind or our thinking. So things like our perception, how we pay attention, how we remember things, any type of distinguishing item in a category, how we visualize things, how we understand and problem solve and make decisions. All of that shows us that cognition is a very complex thing and we have to be able to think about it in complex ways. In the field of psychology, cognitive psychology is the branch that specifically studies the mind and how the mind processes information. This can refer to mental processes such as your perception, your attention, and your memory. Anything the mind creates could fall into the field of cognitive psychology. So when we think about the mind, we need to think about memories that we can recall and form, how we problem solve and consider possibilities, the ways we make decisions, how do we survive on a daily basis, any type of creativity or intelligences we have, all of this relates to the mind and the world and how we see it. So when I think about the mind, I think about my processing of information over time. So to start out, let's um, go back to the very beginning and just kind of work our way up and think about how the field of cognitive psychology was established. It was first established with a man named Donders, who in 1868, that was a long time ago, measured how a person makes a decision. So he measured reaction time and his popular reaction time experiment, which you guys will get some experience with in one of the activities from this week, measures intervals between stimulus presentation. So for example, if you're pressing a key on a keyboard, when you see a light, it is measuring your reaction time. Those of you who go to the ophthalmologist and you have your eyes checked, they measure your reaction time and you have to press a button when you see a symbol so that they'll know that you can see properly. So in Donder's work, he looked at simple tasks, which was requiring a person to press a button quickly after a light appears. And then he also measured some choice tasks, which required a person to push a button if the light was on the right side or the left side. So this chart um, shows you a little bit of an example of what um, the choice uh, reaction time and the simple reaction time study was all about. And if you can look at the chart, you can see that it took one tenth of a second longer to complete the choice reaction time than it did to do the simple reaction time. This tells us that mental processes can't be measured directly, but can be inferred from a participant's behavior. So in other words, we can't really go inside a person's mind to really know what they're thinking. So we have to just make guesses based on their behaviors to understand what they meant. After Donder, Wilhelm Bundt was a psychologist in Germany who in 1879 created the first psychological laboratory. When you took your general psychology course, you may have been taught that Wundt is the father of psychology because he was the first one to create that psychology lab. When Wundt was doing his work, he developed a theory called structuralism. This was the idea that what we experience is based on our sensation. 
Vaughn wanted to look at how the mind was structured and how do we create meaning from the structure that exists. He also believed in analytic interpretation, introspection, and that is when he had participants describe their experiences and how they thought about a process to understand their thinking. Then in 1885, Evan Ha started to do some work with memories and forgetting. So he wanted to test how do people remember certain things and then forget other things. And the best way for him to do that was to have people memorize things that didn't make sense. So nonsense syllables that weren't real words to see if they could remember them. When he did this task and gave people a break, he found that when people engaged in fewer repetitions, they were less likely to remember the information than if they engage in many repetitions. So if you look at the chart that's on the screen, you can see that we are able to remember more information for longer when we go over it more. After Evan Hawes's work came William James. And William James is often thought of as the father of American psychology. He was the first person to teach a psychology course at Harvard University. He liked to observe the functions of mind and he was a functionalist and he considered topics like cognition and thinking and imagination as being important. So he wanted to know how the, main, the brain functioned, not how it was structured. Following William James was the behaviorist psychologist such as John Watson and Watson started to really question thinking. He said that there were two problems related to how people think about situations, that these variables could vary from person to person. And it's really difficult to verify what somebody is thinking on the inside. So Watson didn't really want to explore the mind at all. He said that's not important. It's more important for us to look at behaviors. So that's when the field of behaviorism came about and there was no focus of the mind. It was all about observable behavior, things that we can see and things that we learn. So Watson decided that he wanted to start um, experimenting with different behaviors. And one of the most popular experiences Watson is responsible for is the little Albert experience. And you may remember this experiment from general psychology. So this was a study uh, conducted by Watson and Rayner in 1920. They took a nine month old baby named little Albert. That wasn't his real name. That was the name they used for the study. And they had to take something that um, had meaning to little Albert, which we know that babies naturally have a startle response. And so he needed to test whether or not he could teach a baby to become afraid of something. And so he decided to use a rat. So Watson paired a rat with a loud noise over and over and over and over again to condition little Albert to fear the rat. This created the field of classical conditioning. The idea that we can pair two things that don't have any relation and we can create a response. Watson's experiment was inspired by Pavlov's research with his dogs, his Pavlovian dogs as well but they both were behavioral psychologists who wanted to see, can we pair two things together and get a specific outcome? 
We also have B.F. Skinner, who was also another behavioral psychologist who wanted to study the relationship between two stimuli. And Skinner brought us another field of behaviorism, behaviorism called operant conditioning. And conditioning means learning. So Skinner looked at how can we reward and punish behavior? How can we shape certain behaviors that we want to see? And many of the operant conditioning techniques that Skinner came up with is you know, what our society uses to rear children and of course in the justice system. Whenever we want somebody to do something, we give them a reward. If we don't want something, someone to do something, we need to punish them. So if you look at this timeline, you can kind of see how the field of cognition evolved over time, starting with Donders in 1868 and uh, with behaviorism in the 1930s. After 1938, research started to go back around into the field of cognition starting with Tolman, who trained some rats in a maze. These rats were placed in different parts of the maze and they went to find some food. Uh, Tolman started to say, you know what, these behaviors, I don't know if it's learning. He said, you know what, I think that these rats are creating a map in their mind. So they know where to go because they've mapped it out. And when Tolman did that and he put um, the food in a different place for the rat, it went, a, he put the food in the same place, but then he closed off where the rat could go and started them from a different point and they were, they had to go a different way to find the food. This caused a rejection of the behaviorist perspective and the reemergence of cognition occurred. This is an example of how Tolman used those mazes to try to see, okay, what are these rats really remembering about the food? So after Tolman's research, there was a decline in behaviorism and there was more of a focus on cognition or language. So Skinner said that verbal behavior is when you know children can learn language through operant conditioning, they can mimic what they hear. And then Noam Chomsky came about in 1959 and said that children don't just learn through imitation or reinforcement, they learn because there are biological things that cause learning to happen at certain ages. In order to understand how complex our thinking patterns are, we have to be able to look at measurable behaviors. We have to be able to make inferences about that. And we have to consider what does that behavior say about how the mind works? And is it the same for everyone all the time? Information processing led to a shift from the behaviorist view of things to approaching processing in the mind in terms of what a person is doing in their behavior. So with the information processing approach, we study the mind based on insights associated like a di digital computer. We know that the way the mind works is it occurs in stages and it's much more complex than just saying a simple behavior are saying that there's a simple thought, there are operations that occur. In 1956, Cherry started to build on a lot of William James's idea. He started to present a message in one ear and a message in the other ear. He then looked at whether or not the people he studied could understand the message presented in the first ear after hearing the message in the second ear. Broadbent in 1958 developed a flow diagram to show what occurs when a person directs their attention to one stimulus. So information can be passed 
he found that unattended information does not pass through a filter. And you can see that indicated in the chart below. When there's input, like as, you know, input processing, there's a memory unit, and then there's output. This chart kind of shows the cognitive revolution and how, you know, after Tolman's idea about cognitive mapping, things became a little more complex all the way up until the 60s. We also have to consider artificial intelligence, which is the idea that we can have a machine that behaves in a way that could be just as intelligent as humans are. And the idea of artificial intelligence um, says that, you know, we can kind of create and look at what we need. Newell and Simon created this logic theorist program and created proofs of math mathematical theorems involving these logical principles. Then in 1968, Arkinson and Scherfin developed a three-stage model of memory they said that we have three parts to our memories. We have sensory memories that are very quick, short-term memories that last a few seconds, and long-term memories, which are long and withstanding and kind of permanent. It's the information that we are able to take from our long-term memory that helps us process and learn information over time. Neuropsychology studies um, have been done with people who've experienced brain damage. And those studies have um, given us a lot of information about what it must be like and what different areas of the brain are responsible for certain things. We can use different imaging scans like PET scans and MRIs um, to see those areas of brain damage that might exist. So that is all that you need to know in chapter one. I hope this helps clarify some of the concepts you may have been confused about.